in a certain way, gratitude is the great salvation for just about everything, but certainly for aging. Um, gratitude, in my eyes, is a kind of a waking up, as David Stendhal Rast says. It's an appreciation for life that has the potential to fill your heart. You know, what you're describing in your culture and my culture is I think that there is this struggle for us to live life fully, to live life on our own terms to the very end. Why should life stop at 40 or 50 or 60? Why not expand it? Because I think that we have the capacity to grow spiritually and psychologically until the day we die. So gratitude is a doorway into a life that is fulfilling, a life where we can cultivate thank you, a life where we can cultivate appreciation. And those things can only nourish our heart and our soul. Stay connected to gratitude. Hit the follow button right now and join thousands of listeners tuning in each week. We're the Gratitude Seekers. Come join us. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. Today, we have with us an author, blogger, speaker, and much more. She's an advocate for the positive potential of aging. For several years, she has been writing and studying about the positive, active, and graceful aging movement. She helps self-aware, educated women who are interested in shrinking the toxic myths and stereotypes of aging, which I think is amazing in and of itself, and I'm sure that we will be exploring this topic together. So my guest today is Stephanie Raffalock, and uh, I'm really happy to have her here, and uh, I'm really curious on, on where our conversation will go. So Stephanie, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So Let us know a little bit about, a little bit more about you, about your work. I think it's fascinating and I'm sure that our listeners will uh, find it fascinating as well. The work that I do around aging, the reading and the speaking was a happy accident. It wasn't conscious choice. I was making my way in the world with an encore career as a writer in this part of my life. And I was writing for a large blog called 60 and Me, which is a worldwide blog. And I started getting feedback from women. That's one of the great things about blogging is that you get immediate feedback from people about what you're writing about. And they were all telling the same story. And that is, I'm not ready for retirement. I don't want to go gently into that good night. Um, I, I feel like there's more to life. And, and I sensed a kind of struggle about age that we've had for a long time. I started to write about aging and our attitudes about aging, not only how the culture sees us, but how we see ourselves. And I came to the conclusion that if we're feeling insignificant or irrelevant as we age, that's a call that's coming from inside the house, that we need to look closely at what our own attitudes and what our own platform for self-love is as we age. Because when you look at age, it's really a remarkable and noble passage to grow old. First of all, not everybody gets to do it. Second of all, there's a reason that nature keeps us alive past the age of childbearing years. So what is the reason that nature keeps us alive? And as I do this work, what I find is nature keeps us around because this is our time of contemplation. This is our time to elder, to learn how to listen deeply to the young people around us and be a light to them and an encouragement and inspiration to them. So that's the work I do now. My second book comes out this August. And once again, I'm dealing with the topic, 
of women and aging. Um, it's not that men don't age, but in this culture, women have uh, a little bit more difficult uh, challenge in that regard than men do. Hmm. That's very interesting. And um, it's very interesting that, that you mentioned culture. Um, one of the interesting things that I've seen in, in my travels, uh, especially in Western Europe, was the difference between um, women of, let's, let's take age 60 or more, um, compared to how, how women are uh, in Romania at that age. And um, for instance, going out uh, for a meal, for a drink, in, in our culture at that age is something that they just don't do or getting dressed in a certain way and going out, that's, again, something that's um, really um, weird for, uh, for women of, of that age. But I've seen, uh, for instance, in Vienna, I've seen women that got all dressed up and went uh, for a drink with friends or with um, um, relatives, and they were, I don't know, I, I, I guess they were like 70, 80 years old. And it seemed something very natural for them. And uh, for me, it was, a, it was a cultural shock seeing that they, they still had appreciation for, for themselves and gave themselves this, um, this opportunity to, to enjoy life, to just be and to to come contemplate like like you said and um yeah i think it's it's very interesting that we're able to to speak about these things from uh different viewpoints because we usually like 100 years ago or or so we only saw one possibility of um of aging, of an attitude towards aging, and uh, that was usually the only one. Now, thankfully, we have other options, we have other um, viewpoints, and you're, you're doing some amazing work in, uh, in helping, helping us see a different way, and I think that's, that's amazing. So, one of the first things that uh, I would like to ask you is how do you see gratitude and how do you see it uh, related to aging? Well, in a certain way, gratitude is the great salvation for just about everything, but certainly for aging. Um, gratitude, in my eyes, is a kind of a waking up, as David Stindl Rast says. It's an appreciation for life that has the potential to fill your heart. You know, what you're describing in your culture and my culture is, I think that there is this struggle for us to live life fully, to live life on our own terms to the very end. Why should life stop at 40 or 50 or 60? Why not expand it? Because I think that we have the capacity to grow spiritually and psychologically until the day we die. So gratitude is a doorway into a life that is fulfilling, um, a life where we can cultivate thank you, and a life where we can cultivate appreciation. And those things can only nourish our heart and our soul. So gratitude and attitude of gratitude, gratitude for what is and for where we are and opening oneself to the surprise and delight of life can only seek to serve our hearts and our souls, can only seek to alleviate the um, stresses of life. And, you know, if you've got creaky knees, gratitude that you can still walk around the block, um, that's something. Definitely. I think um, so. One of the the, the things that um, 
I spoke about that at one point on the podcast is the fact that we should appreciate this exact moment in time because we we're not get, getting any younger and um, people say those were the days you know like in the past um, the good old days and and so on and so forth but these are actually the days that we would we will uh, speak of as being the good old days at one point and if we are able to be aware of this i i think we can enjoy them even more and uh, that that was my perspective on aging and um surely it's it's complementary to uh, to to your work and to the things that you are doing um, absolutely i think it's it's a gift that we are where we are at this point that we are alive that we are um that our body works great even though uh, all of us have different things that uh, aren't working great sometimes um but seeing the whole picture i believe that this has a big big impact and it helps us appreciate where we where we are right now and um but the the perspective that i was very curious about is what would be some some things that people could um be grateful for regarding aging well the first thing that comes to mind is that it is a noble passage this is a time in life where you really have slowed down enough to contemplate and appreciate the overarching story of your life. It's a time in life where you have the moments to sit on a front porch and appreciate the nature that's right outside your door. It's the time in life where you can reflect upon all that you've learned because life is a journey that's up and down and it's all about what we learn about being better, about being bigger human beings. And if you've reached a point in life where you're older and you think, well, I didn't become a better or a bigger human being, I don't think that it's ever too late to start. How can we expand ourselves even now at this age? So I think that aging gives us a, a point of view, a reflection that younger age does not give us. Because we, you know, we're busy in the, in the business of um, raising children, of you know, paying a mortgage, of making a living, of doing all those things. And even though at this stage of my life, I'm still engaged in making a living, my life is a little bit slower. And there, is a lo- there are a lot of gifts in that slowness of age. I walk a little slower. I see more in the neighborhood. So there's just a list. The the Gift of Years uh, was the name of a book by Sister Joan Chittister, which is about aging with grace and gratitude. And uh, the years do hold gifts for us. Most definitely. And many of the riches that we and get to enjoy are actually inside of us and um i'm sure that as we age our wealth gets bigger and bigger our wealth of knowledge our wealth of friends our wealth of um wisdom and yeah i think yes this uh, is the potential of the abundant life isn't it exactly yeah and since we're we're at this topic, I'm curious what what are some myths and stereotypes of aging? Like, what do people fear? We were talking we were talking about the, the positives, the the things that we can be grateful for. But what are some things uh, that you believe are actually toxic? Some myths and stereotypes of um, aging. Well, we have a fear that we're going to break down and get sick. I use my mother as an example. She lived till the age of 89. And it was really only in her last six to eight months where her health took this steady decline. And and we knew, and she knew, 
that she was receding from the world. But she did not spend her older years, her 70s and most of her 80s, in some kind of sickened state. And I think people fear that. We, we live in a time where there have been medical advances and um, advances in what we know about just keeping ourselves healthy that serve us. People fear losing their minds. And I don't know what it's like to have Alzheimer's or dementia, but I'll tell you a story that my husband had a dear friend that he had known since he was 20 years old, who was a big part of his life. And she was, I, I would say, a good 25 years older than he was. And toward the end of her life, she got dementia. And he called her one day and, and her daughter put her on, the on, her on the phone with him. And she didn't know who she was talking to. And he used to have this silly name for her. He called her Bananas. And he began to say to her, Bananas, Bananas, it's me. And finally, there was this long silence. And she said, oh, Dean, you found me. And for this wow. one moment, she was lucid. And there was this great connection, like the love had not stopped. And he said, he was not of the mind to say, where are you? Describe it to me. It was enough that they had connected. So when I think of Alzheimer's and dementia, I don't think that that's necessarily a hellish place. Um, my husband's mother lived with dementia for several years before she died. She did not remember her children. She did not remember her husband. But she did remember how to play the piano. And she found this great joy every day in the home that she was living in at sitting down at the keyboard, that part of her brain still worked, and playing music that made the people around her happy and made her happy. So I think that we fear what we don't know. And we don't know what dementia is or Alzheimer's is as far as the person who has it. But perhaps it's not the dark, fearful place that we think it is. I think it's more the fear of getting there that is so disturbing to us. Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take about 20,000 breaths a day. According to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air and in some cases up to 100 times more polluted. Data shows that air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million premature deaths globally. We are fortunate enough to live outside the city with easy access to it and a green meadow view outside the window. The not so fortunate part is that when we open the windows we can hear all the constant traffic close to us and the air quality isn't the best. Aside from that our neighbors have a passion for using all kinds of fossil fuel motors to build or cut grass. I love doing breath work, I'm sure you do too. And it's in those moments when you breathe deeply that you become aware of the quality of the air you breathe and how important it actually is. So what's the solution? Introducing an air purifier that captured the attention of established media outlets such as CNN, Money, ABC and more. Air Doctor. Air Doctor filters out 99.99% .99 of dangerous contaminants and allergens such as pollen pet dander, dust mite, mold, and even bacteria and viruses, so your lungs don't have to. All air doctor purifiers also feature whisper jet fans, 30% quieter than ordinary air purifiers. Air doctor also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code GRATITUDE and depending on the model, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Exclusive to podcast customers, you will also receive a free 3-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock this special offer by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code GRATITUDE. I understand. And for for the people that have um all the relatives that um are in those situations, 
Um, do you have any tips? Do you have any um, ways of uh, for them to deal with it easier? I think it's important to keep talking to those people for one thing, not necessarily to try to bring them back, but just to be present in their life for wherever they are, however they are. And I think that part is important. I also think that as a caregiver, it's very important to take care of oneself and realize that it takes a tremendous amount of time and energy to take care of an aging parent who might have health concerns. But the same is true of taking care of a, of a small child. You don't leave a two-year-old alone in the house, you know, with access to the oven um, or, or some of your breakable things. And so it's a, it's a similar kind of thing. It's kind of like, you know, bookend parenting. But once again, we fear this decline in older age that often doesn't come. Sometimes it comes just in that small window. And this is the one of, one of the things that I've looked at. There was a wonderful um, study done here at Harvard. Um, Valiant, I believe, was the doctor's name who oversaw this Harvard study, which is one of the longest ongoing studies about aging. And he said, you know, aging with all its physical decline and mental decline isn't really as bad as we think it is. And at the end of the day, it's not so much, you know, the numbers on your blood pressure or your blood test that count. It's the gratitude that you have in your heart. It's another reason to cultivate gratitude and appreciation as we age so that as we get to a point where we begin to recede from life, I believe that it is easier to let go when we are saying thank you. Most definitely, most definitely. And um, I think, like you said, actually, um, things are going by so fast as we uh, get older and at least until some, a certain point. And um, when we have the time to just meditate on them, we have the option to be um, the, the, the grumpy old um, lady or man <laughs> or um, the, the grateful one, the one that is appreciative of all of the gestures of the neighbors, of family or of nature and all of the experiences that he or she had until that that moment in time because like with the with the experiences that we have right now i believe that once we get to have more time and look back at all of the experiences that we had we have this option to choose to be bitter about all of the things that didn't work and also we can choose to to be grateful for for those experiences that were beautiful isn't it yes and i i think it's also an opportunity to be grateful for the stuff that didn't work <laughs> um <laughs> there is there is a kind of um texturing to the heart that creates empathy empathy and compassion are not created by a smooth sailing life empathy and compassion are created in one because you've had some rough spots because you've suffered because you know grief. And so the hard stuff of life, as well as the joy and celebration of life, begin to get closer and closer together, and they sit side by side in our heart. And that's another way of, of holding life and, and loving life, that you know every clueless bad decision, bad choice that you ever made, that's part of what made you who you are too. And full acceptance of who you are as we get older, you know, I, I think it prepares us for that ultimately, that ultimate letting go, that how we live life has everything to do with how we die. Not to sound morbid about that, but to, to nourish our souls for that moment when 
you know, the energy returns to that from which it came. That's really a beautiful thought. I will become stardust again. <laughs> wow. That's really a beautiful perspective. And yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you something that's that's more personal for me. Um, it's a challenge that uh, that I'm now facing. Um, it's it's a bit hard for me to see uh, my parents getting old, and knowing that they once were like my my dad, that he was so strong, and now he uh, he lets me carry things that he didn't let me in the past, for instance, mm -hmm. or my mom that was very um uh very careful with all all details uh, related to the house that now she's n not that uh thorough in some aspects and for me the the first feeling that that i felt was was sadness somehow it was really hard to see them like that you know like um your heroes are uh i don't know they are uh, no longer capable or as capable of of being your heroes from from some points of view and um i'm wondering what what's your perspective on this how how we can um have a better approach or a um i don't know a deeper perspective on this I think the deeper perspective on this is to realize that old age takes place against a backdrop of grief. And grief is one of the greatest transformative forces in life. Now, you can get stuck in it, or you can face it and walk through it. Your mom may be letting stuff go around the house. She just doesn't feel that she has to do it all anymore. Your dad doesn't feel like he has to carry it all anymore. That's a blessing to them. And the fact that they're still moving slowly through the world, um, it is heroic. To, to age with some grace is heroic. It takes courage to get up every day and say, one more day and i'm going to find the things i'm grateful for i'm going to find something joyful in today and it's it's you know i think that as i get older it's the smaller things it's not the big things anymore it's that first cup of tea in the morning that sweet black tea that i love so much that i've been drinking every day since i was probably 13 years old i like to sit on the front porch and just watch with that. But heroes don't necessarily connote um, the strength of, you know, holding up buildings. I, I often say to women, you know, women's courage isn't gold wristbands on your wrist and a gold breastplate, you know, like Wonder Woman. Women's courage is more often like skinned knees and baby barf on your shoulder. <laughs> and the, the courage of growing older isn't so much that you can still do what you did, but that you are facing a brand new horizon that you've not traversed before. And there's no rule book. There's no guidebook. And that you're going to walk it anyway. That to me is heroic. That's so true. That's so true. And yeah, it is a, a wonderful perspective full of um, love and appreciation. For I think it's good to cry too, honestly, you know, from your story. It's mm -hmm. like to feel the sorrow and to let oneself cry. Tears are cleansing. And there's a lot of love in tears. If you've, if you've ever, ever noticed after you've had a good cry, it's like your heart just feels open. Yeah. And so to give oneself to the grief and the tears so that the heart becomes more open that's the transformative force of grief it makes so much sense yeah once you you actually let yourself feel it it 
it can be transformative and it can lead to, to something uh, even deeper and even more beautiful. Yeah, I, I love that. And um, since we're we're nearing the end of our time together, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your new book, Critics Rising, Unlocking the Power of Midlife Women. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and where our audience can get it? The book is available for pre-order now. You can get it at uh, bookshop.org or indiebound.org. The book, Creatrix Rising, Creatrix is a name that I'm using to substitute for the word crone. And crone entered the lexicon sometime in the 1300s. It means disagreeable old woman. <laughs> and no woman I know wants that title. So creatrix is, um, it is a word that means a woman who makes things. And all around me, in my country, I see women finding their voice at 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And this was evidenced by, by two big markers in just the last few years. The first one was the Women's March of 2017, where so many women came out in force and marched together um, in unity. And the second one that was the following year, 2018, more women ran for local, state, and national office than ever before in the history of this country. And so now you're seeing lots and lots of women in leadership roles that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and they are creatrices. They are the creatrix. So this book is about um, unlocking your power doesn't mean that there's a power on the outside of you. It means that there's this great, tremendous power on the inside of you. And it's not a power over something. It's the power of compassion. It's the power of forgiveness. It's the power of gratitude. It's the power of being awake and aware, living life fully and with as much love as you can. That's what Creatrix Rising is about. And it's told through um, my personal stories and the stories of women that I've known. Wow, that's wonderful. And indeed, we're, we're living some amazing times. And um, I'm really happy. I believe that we really need this kind of energy and we need the kind of nurturing that the, the women can bring. Because men are, are great from many points of view, they, they have many qualities, but um, I believe that for us to enjoy balance and for, for us to enjoy uh, an even more beautiful world, this is necessary for, for all of us. And it's, it's amazing that there are um, creatresses, uh, like you like to call them, that are doing this work and that are taking us to to the next level and i'm really curious how the world will be in i don't know 10 20 years after all of these um creatresses manage to do what they that what they envision because one of the one of the things that i I've seen, at least in my experience, even though I'm young, um, experience actually is very helpful with seeing different patterns that once, when you're very young, you, you just can't see them. You're just in your, in your square and um, you try to, to experience the world and um, understand it as much as possible but as you age at least <laughs> this is how it, it has been for me as i aged um i be i began to to see different patterns i be began to understand how things work and either do something to change them or accept them and um create a way in which i can adapt so that it makes sense for me and uh, yeah, I think 
this is one of the gifts of um, aging, right? Yes. Yes. To, to embrace all of it, to see all of it. We don't awaken just once, do we? We awaken mm. and we reinvent ourselves again and again and again. And that holds true even in one's 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. We can awaken and grow until the day we die. That's so true. And yeah, it's up to us to, to reinvent who we are and what we do and and everything. So we have we can have unlimited um, new beginnings and different directions for our lives. So I think this is another um, amazing thing that that we can um, think about. So Stephanie, thank you for all of the things that you've shared with us. Thank you for all of your amazing tips and ideas and wisdom. And um, yeah, let us know where can our can our audience get in touch with you you can find me at byline-stephanie.com and there's a way to contact me on that site and i answer all emails perfect perfect once again thank you very much it has been a, a real pleasure thank you so much hey gratitude seeker thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this interview I really appreciate it. And if you could think of one person that would also benefit from it, share it with them. It might actually be the inspiration that they need to make their day or maybe even their life much better. Thank you so much once again. This has been Georgian Benta. Don't forget to keep seeking and spreading gratitude. Are you experiencing more lack in your life than you used to? Unfortunately, some things are not in our control. but we can control how we see them. Join me on a seven-week journey from lack to abundance through gratitude. Go to georgianbenta.com slash abundance course. That's georgianbenta.com slash abundance course to join me now.